good morning, Grace. So glad you could join us here online. Hope you're having a wonderful day and uh, enjoying the winter weather. Um, this morning, a few announcements before we jump into the Word. First is that uh, if uh, you are interested in volunteering, you've been watching online and uh, or you're watching online this morning uh, and you're interested to volunteer with Kids Church, uh, we'd love for you to talk to Megan or Lindsay about that. And then as well, uh, if you are giving this morning, you can do that online uh, through our website, uh, igrace.ca slash giving, uh, or you can give uh, through e-transfer at giving at igrace.ca. Um, and before we jump into the message this morning, I wanted to remind you, uh, just check in with you about Lent, which we talked about last week. It started on Wednesday. Uh, and so I want uh, you just to know it's not too Lent to start. Uh, that, you know, if you haven't begun yet, that it's not too Lent and you can get into it. And we'd love to invite you to join and be a part of what we're doing. And um, on the surface, I wanted just to remind us for a second about Lent. On the surface, it can feel like a season of us denying ourselves. But what we saw last week was that, you know, when we see God's heart, we actually realize that Lent is a season of desire, of aligning our hearts and our lives and our habits more fully with our eternal desires. And it's a time for action. And so I want to encourage you that Lent is a time where we, we get up and we, we practice and we, in, we engage in a fresh way. And so I encourage you to this season to dive into three practices. And so uh, if you are around the church at all, you can find this here. Uh, we just made a little sheet for you uh, about Lent. And it talks about committing to three practices. That's what we're trying to do. Committing to a holy fast. Committing to the practice of non-casual prayer. And committing to a practice of discerning God's call to repentance. And uh, I like for you to just if you if you're able to just write that down this this week or maybe even today write down what it is you're committing to and then share it with someone tell them about it tell it to your husband or your wife or to your kids or to your friends and ask them how they're practicing lent and how you can pray for them and with them so bless you in that i want to encourage you to uh to to give your heart uh, in a fresh way to god why don't we take a moment and we'll pray as we jump into acts this morning so Jesus, we, we come, Lord, with uh, expectant hearts this morning. We come because we want to be transformed and shaped, and we know that your word uh, brings us a challenge and, 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 and calls us to a different way of living in response to your great grace. We thank you, Jesus. You are beautiful. You are worthy. We honor you, and we come, Lord, hungry to hear, hungry to understand. So Lord, stir up the soil of our hearts, Lord, and give us listening ears. In your, in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we're back today in Acts, in chapter 8, and we're going to read from verse 4 all the way to 25 in a few moments. And the story we're reading today is a thrilling one about Philip, Philip's evangelistic encounter with a sorcerer named Simon in the region of Samaria. And as we read it, I think th and think through the story together, it's going to offer us this opportunity to sharpen our spiritual discernment. And our discernment is something of great importance. And it's, it's something of great importance for each of us is that we practice discernment. And specifically, our story today is going to give us, help us understand and develop our discernment about something that's really important, which is the nature of the gospel. We've got to discern the gospel, the good news. That's what it means. The gospel means the good news about Jesus. And it matters because, as we'll see, there is only one true gospel. There's one true one, but there are also many false ones or false versions of the gospel. And by that, I mean there are many diverging paths, as we're, as we're seeking to follow God, that Divergent paths, false gospels that can lead us away unknowingly from the truth and from the freedom that Jesus so greatly desires to give us and have us walk in and share. Now, while false gospel, I know that sounds like a scary word, false gospel. Who's practicing the false gospel? It sounds 
uh, you know, like a, like a heresy hunting kind of thing. But, but I want to explain it to you because it's also a pretty broad category. And it's easy to, to, to actually veer off the path if we're not careful. And that's why we need discernment. So let me try and explain the false, false gospel by suggesting that there's really two main categories to understand it. In. The first category involves any belief, religion, spiritual path, philosophy, or human paradigm that promises life or goodness to us apart from Jesus. Any, any version of philosophy, spiritual belief, religion, practice that offers us, us goodness or life apart from Jesus. And in our story today, you'll see that that's actually what Simon has to get rid of. He's a sorcerer, and so he has to get rid of those false beliefs. Now, so you're not confused. Any of the, any, I mean, if we live in a, in, a, in, a, in a very multicultural world, and I don't mean that multi-ethnic, I mean multicultural. There's all sorts of cultures, spiritual cultures, uh, religious cultures, um, just I do, uh, paradigms of belief. And in any of these religions, philosophies, or paths, all of them may contain certain levels of truth. So we're not, we're not looking around at the world and saying, well, there's nothing true in that. They may even be helpful, and that's true of many things. That's often why we, we practice them or we integrate them into our lives is because they seem helpful to us. And they may even sound familiar to us because we're, of our familiarity with Jesus, they may talk about things like sacrifice. They may talk about love. However, if their promises, and this is where we want to practice discernment, if their promises and the path don't lead us to Jesus or through Jesus, then they can't ultimately be the gospel or the good news because they're not rooted in the reality of God as he's revealed himself. So I hope that's clear. That is one kind of false gospel. It's one big category intent. All sorts of spiritual beliefs that don't ultimately require or have to do with Jesus. And as Christians living in this multicultural world, we need discernment and courage in order to refrain from being compromised or end up um, entertaining false gospels, false ways of getting the good life. And yet we must also not at the same time become discouraged, fearful, or paranoid of their presence around us. Instead, we have to be watchful and wise, and that's what discernment is about. The second category, though, of false gospel, where, where we veer off the path, is more difficult to perceive because it actually involves the act of something called syncretism. Now, if you haven't heard of syncretism, or you don't know what the word means, it's the act, syncretism refers to the act of combining together two different systems of belief. So, you know, I believe this, this is true about Jesus, and we kind of put them together. Two different versions of good news come together like a synthesis, or you unite them, that's syncretism, synthesis, or you synthesize them together. So it's actually, I mean, this should be fairly common in our day. It's, it's the spiritual assumption of most of our culture is that we, we should or can do this with belief systems. We can just put them together. Almost every modern person is practicing some version of spiritual syncretism. In the absence of, of believing in some sort of singular truth or uh, meta story, <laughs> and also because we get offended by those certain ideas that claim specific or ultimate truth, because things all of a sudden in our, in our, in our day, we're, we're evaluating our beliefs and going, well, these seem unpopular. They, don't, they seem a little bit clunky, and so I don't know if I want to believe them anymore. They seem unpalatable. We think that we actually need to become syncretists. We actually need to, to meld in some other things to help maybe this Christian worldview that we have kind of not be so antiquated or old or, or maybe we're afraid of it being judgmental. And so we, we think we have the wisdom to definitely adopt and welcome all sorts of ideas together into a new kind of sort of metaphysical stew. There we are. We're just going to bring it all together. We're going to mix it around. It's not the faith of my fathers. It's, it's something I've concocted myself. Now, as Christians, we obviously are at risk for this. And, and, and it can happen whenever the one true gospel gets added to anything else. I don't mean contextualized, I mean added and integrated in a way that, and I'll explain this, when the good news is adopted into someone's pre-existing belief system. 
But instead of becoming the foundational principle by which everything else is organized in your life, you simply just add it together. These other old beliefs don't have to, to die or to be subjugated to the gospel. They just kind of get mixed together. Now, in our story, we'll see both categories of false gospels are confronted by the true gospel, the proclamation of Jesus and his kingdom, as Philip and Peter are speaking. However, it's the second kind, the syncretism, that I think bears special focus for our reflection because it's the one that all of us are going to have to already and, and continually deal with. We're going to have to watch that discernment that we don't go off the path of, tr of the true gospel. We don't always see the conflict, of course, between the gospel and the culture we live in that we're a part of, but it's there. It's not the same. They don't work together. And if we think about it, you know, reflect with me for a moment. Aren't there things within, you know, within your heart, your core beliefs, fears, shames, that are actually contrary to God's word and God's view and God's truth? And yet they live enmeshed together in your heart? It's, not, it's no surprise for any of us if we were to confess that internally there's still parts of the gospel that have yet to fully renew and align the good news of Jesus with our own hearts and our own reality. Aren't there places where you find you're frustratingly, you're, you know, they're in process, you're, they're frustratingly operating out of the, or hoping for, or trusting in things that aren't rooted really in the new life that Jesus promises. And wherever that's at work, that's syncretism. We're all syncretists on some level. And it's that clash of values and beliefs. And it's, it's the false gospels of the world or our past or, or, or even our hopes and dreams that are at war within us that Jesus actually wants us to, to pay attention to, to root out by grace so that he can bring peace to our souls. I think that's important. That's actually what Lent's about. And that's why I'm hoping today, as we see this thing happen in the life of Simon the sorcerer, and it's going to be dramatic, it might lead us into a new place of repentance in our hearts. That it would then also sharpen our discernment and insight into what we believe and how we are living. Because we need wisdom and discernment for the world that we live in. Every day, in the expected and the unexpected, there are so many decisions and choices externally and internally that we have to navigate. So many snap decisions that we make because of the beliefs that we hold that shape our day and our ability to love in our hearts. So I think it's important we spend some time thinking about the framework of discernment that we use to make these decisions. What's the framework? How do things level out in your heart? And to reveal by comparison what is actually true. What's the true gospel? And are we believing it? Is it true in your heart? Is it right? And what are the off-ramps and temptations the false gospel offers us that we need to be aware of in our culture? My hope is that we observe people in the story observing and hearing and responding to the good news. We might reflect on how we're hearing it and responding and living it. So let's read it together. Acts 8, verse 4. And it says, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the sign, when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him for a long time because he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom, the gospel, about the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. 
Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, in Acts, when they receive the Holy Spirit like this, it's often, it's often connected to actually being empowered for mission. This isn't them being actually like legit saved. It's, this is them actually receiving the Spirit, the commission and the filling of the Spirit in a fresh way so that they can go on mission. And when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also so that anyone on whom I may lay, lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought that you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray, that the, pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity or injustice. And Simon answered, pray to me Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now the brilliance of this story is that through the conflict of Simon and Peter, we can form a clear picture of the nature of the true gospel and the common fallacies at work in any false gospel. We'll actually see where he got it wrong. And while the fallacies seem specific, I think, on some level to Simon, the underlying issues of Simon's heart are not. They are common to each of us. They are, we're all at risk of doing what Simon did. We all, we all see that we must confess these issues and we must seek repentance in order to be restored. That's the only solution that's offered. And that's because and, and, the, and the force of all of that is because we want the real thing. We don't want to stay like Simon with some form of godliness that actually denies the power. We don't want a watered-down, compromised, syncretistic version of the glorious truth of God's good news that only looks good on the surface but set, fails to actually set us free and renew us in God's image and life. Now, Jesus shared an important parable about the potential of this very problem for our lives. It's called the parable of the sower, and you may have heard of it. And in, in it, his contention is that the good news of God's kingdom was like a good seed. We talked about seeds last month. But when shared, when scattered, when planted, there were at least four different types of soil in which the good news tends to land. The soil here refers to He's not talking about actual soil, but the, the, the condition of the human heart as it hears and, as, and its ability to understand the good news. And so there's this refrain in the parable as Jesus is saying it, that we're called to be a people who really understand. Understand. That word understanding means to perceive or to have insight. It's actually a really similar word to the word syn 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 to, like to synthesize but just simply to say, actually, to adopt and to synthesize everything around that truth. In Jewish thought, understanding and revelation was something that God gave to people as a gift. If you're unfamiliar, and I'll just go through this quick, the first soil that it lands on is, is a heart that lacks understanding, by which he means he hears the good news, but he, he fails to integrate it or, or actually have any insight into it. And so it doesn't, he doesn't engage the truth at a heart level. He hears it, he maybe understands it a little bit in his mind, but he doesn't integrate it. The second is the person who receives it with joy, but does not hold on to it because of tribulation or persecution, because it, it's costly. The third is the person who receives it, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth are so present that they render its effect in their life unfruitful. They're so concerned about other things, they actually don't really understand the gospel and its call. And then the last one, of course, is the one, and it's a pretty broad category, who hears and understands. 
They may have wealth, but they understand and they integrate. They may hear it, but they actually let it sink in their hearts. They may hear it, but they hold on to it in the midst of trouble or persecution. And they integrate it and they tend to it. And with that in mind, let's look at the specific contrast that Simon faces because there's at least two unique ways that he has to wrestle with receiving the good news into the soil of his heart. And the first way that the soil of Simon's heart has been conditioned is by pride. In a way that he's perceived his life through the lens of, his, of self first. This is the soil in which the good news comes into Simon's heart. And it, and it lands, and the soil of his heart is full of pride. See, when Simon, see, Simon wasn't a nobody when he heard the good news the first time. He, he, he was actually a successful, important, respected, and even reverentially awed magician or sorcerer in his community. And he, as a result of his, his renowned spiritual power, Simon is a somebody. It says everybody, great and small, revered him. He was already great among men, and he enjoyed the attention and respect of them. In fact, his name bears an allusion to the possibility when they say this man is the great power of God, the power of God that is called great. They think it's probably also, also a partly, it's an allusion to being partially divine or to be God's right-hand man, or almost angelic in that place, like he was God's representative. If there was social media, he would have been, you know, at the great power of God. But as much as, um, as, as, but we are much the same, even if we aren't as accomplished as Simon or as confident. We have the same issue. Our, our, we have pride, and, and we put ourselves first. We're similar, similarly plagued, in our culture, in our day, the soil of, of this world, with the sense of self-importance. Self-importance. Our world is obsessed with itself, isn't it? Everything everywhere is about yourself. I mean, I, I don't think that's controversial. Everything is about yourself. We are so deep, we so deeply long to matter as people. We're convinced the discovery of ourself is our great calling because we know that we matter somehow. And we have to figure it out. Finding then our true selves, and you'll hear this language, find your true self, being your true self, is surely a therapeutic obsession at this point in our culture. Everybody's on a hunt. And it's because we can all feel that somehow in our hearts. We all understand we've lost something of ourselves. We're not whole. And, and somehow we have to find or peel back. Sometimes even religion is painted as the enemy of all of this. And, and in a certain way, they're not wrong. See, while it's true, we have lost our identity and our calling. Our culture believes the solution to finding ourselves is, in, is by continually casting ourselves as the main character in a story that is that has us at the center of the universe. Everybody's at the center of their own universe. It's so individualistic. There's no great story. And it's in the air we breathe, and, and it's really the prison in which we live, is that everything is about us. We end up chasing in that, in that setup our own tales. And we're all unable, because of fear and death, to see much beyond ourselves. Our great hope is that we'll find ourselves. The raging current, and I mean, what's the word to, re, to, to, to describe someone <laughs> who, who is obsessed with themselves? Well, we call that selfish, selfish. It's a raging current of selfishness is almost impossible to avoid being caught up, caught up in. And so it's not surprising that when Simon hears the good news and we hear the good news, we quite quickly assume its promises, the promises of God, have to do with buoying our sense of self. That's what God's here to do. He's here, he's here to help you. That the good news will lead us to a place of self-exaltation or at least self-satisfaction because that's the world we live in. That's the, the primary lens through which we view life. We assume that if God loves us so greatly, and he does, <laughs> that, that he must be there to, to serve our terribly individualistic goals of being something, of being something great, 
or of being prosperous or respected or loved or appreciated or known. And it's so funny because this is, you can see how this actually, that is sort of the language of the good news, is that we, we are loved and treasured by God, and yet when you have a, a lens of self, when the soil of your heart is selfish, it actually twists that. It doesn't do well. The seed doesn't grow. And this, of course, is the false gospel of self-exaltation. Because ultimately, we know we've heard the gospel, or we think we've heard the gospel, when ourselves are exalted, when our dreams come true. And you can't remain in that place of pride in the presence of a holy God. Self-exaltation is not something that we are responsible for. Rather, the gospel says, humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. The true gospel works through humility. The gospel doesn't make much of us. It makes much of God. It's the good news about Jesus. And that has an implication for you and me. Now let it be said that humility is not hatred of self as some people might have you believe. Oh, you just, you're a worm. You know, if, you, if you're going to be humble, you have to hate yourself. For you cannot be humble. You, you will never be humble by hating or being suspicious or ashamed of yourself. That is not the gospel. That's not the good news. You cannot become humble by despising the good creation that God made, that God breathed, that God loves with his whole heart, that God died to save. Don't name that as evil. Don't name it as something that is worthy of hate. No, instead, humility is the condition of the soil of the heart of those who truly understand the good news. And the good news is this. Jesus is the king. And he's come and saved us through a sacrificial death. He's made a way for us. The true gospel is that as we find ourselves so deeply loved by God, we willingly bow our knee in joyful surrender to him. That's what it means to be humble. It means to make much of God. And as God is praised, as God is made great, as he's worshipped, magnified, adored, and sought after with our whole lives, we discover in that who we are in his love and what we're called to do in his kingdom. Our purposes, everything is in him and to him and through him to the world. So this is the, the soil that we're actually called to, to, to cultivate in our hearts. is a soil of adoration and worship and humility before God. Not hating ourselves, but loving him wholeheartedly with our mind, our strength, everything. And this is the question is, this morning is, how much of yourself, how much, of, how much, of, how much has pride actually warped that joyful life of surrender and honor? And how much have you been chasing after the exaltation of self rather than allowing God to lift you up? So the second way, moving on, is the soil, the soil of Simon's heart has been preconditioned is, and, and that he has to deal with, right, is by greed rather than grace. And we see this when he offers them money to buy the, the, the power of the Spirit so that the Holy Spirit's upon him so that he too can share in its impact and potentially maybe its profit. I'm not sure what he imagines will happen. It seems he actually does. And, and funny enough, I mean, Simon, in, in Christ, when we receive the gift of God, we are called to lay our hands on people, to bless them, and for the Spirit to come. That is part of a normal Christian life. And it seems he does actually, he, he gets, I think he gets it. He, he realizes this is meant to help and to participate in this work. You're called to that. But his framework that he has internally, the soil of his heart is not built on the gospel, but, but on his, still on his, parada, his, his pagan paradigm of magic. See, in that day it was common for magicians and sorcerers to trade secrets or formulas for money amongst each other. This is what they would do. They knew little secrets and so they'd buy them. And in doing so, they would become more powerful or more renowned. And 
I, I don't actually think Simon was insincere or really aware of the actual offense that he caused. I mean, judging by his reaction, when he offered the money, he didn't see it coming. He thought, of course, I'll just continue doing what I've always done. The issue was that his world was still magic. The soil of his heart was still that paradigm. Magic was his wheelhouse. This is his area of strength and expertise. And, and he, he thought that while this power that Philip had was simply a greater version of what he had, it was essentially the same thing. And as we see, but as we see, his magic power and his sorcery was not the same as the power of God at all. These aren't the same things. I mean, we make this mistake all the time. We assume that our wisdom is just, you know, just a little bit smaller version of God's wisdom. That our strength is actually just a smaller version of God's strength. But they're not. It wasn't magic power that could be bought or sold or manipulated, but God's free gift of grace that was at work in the human heart. That's what he saw. It was grace at work. And the grace of God, we realize, is different than what Simon was experiencing, what he had been practicing. See, grace is the opposite of magic. It, it can't be controlled or manipulated. It's the wonderful surprise of God who lavishes his, his grace and his mercy on undeserved, und, undeservedly and unreservedly on all who might receive it. It cannot be manipulated or controlled by human hands. See, magic in that day, and I'm sure still today, is, is really, it is the opposite of that. Think about what you know about magic. Magic can be defined as the attempt to control the divine powers through the application of certain techniques or esoteric formulas. So think spells, curses, blessings, cards, you know, seance, whatever you want to call it, prayer, healing, Simon was skilled in all of these things, and yet none of that would help him prepare or prepare him for grace. Actually, it was, it was a roadblock. He thought, well, this is the same thing. In fact, what, what did Simon realize when Peter turned to him and rebuked him? He realized all of what he thought that he knew would actually need to be forgotten. It would actually need to be discarded, burned, rejected, wholeheartedly, if he was ever going to receive anything from God. There was nothing that he could mesh together here of the old and the new. And that's why Peter is so harsh with him, because he knows how deeply Simon will be tempted to approach grace in the future the way that he approached magic. Through a paradigm of earning, using his heart of greed and his eye for self-promotion to, to make it happen. To, to sort of say the right things and, and do the right things, all the while rejecting or not grabbing hold of what was really being offered, which is a life in union with God. Peter says instead, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. And don't you imagine this morning the Holy Spirit is just as, I mean, if you can hear the, 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 the authority in Peter's words, don't you imagine the Holy Spirit is just as fiercely protective with our similar areas of weakness or strength? Of the places where we are blind, where we bring the old in, are conditioned, like Simon, to simply presume that we understand the nature of grace. We, we assume the old is really like the new, and it's not. The Holy Spirit actually lives, he moves, and he breathes, he comes. It says to convict the world of sin and righteousness. The Holy Spirit lives to tear down every lie that the enemy might try to use to twist the good news. The enemy loves to import the old into the new, and the Holy Spirit is saying, you shall not pass. He despises the false gospel because he knows it robs us of the real blessing of God. The enemy knows if he can, and, and this is the thing, Peter understands this about the world. He understands that the enemy is at work in our lives and in our culture, and he's always trying to get in. He's always trying to make a way. He's always trying to meld things together syncretistically in order to corrupt 
the outcome. So we go, I get this gospel, but it's not doing anything. I get this gospel, and, and it doesn't seem to have the effect. I get this gospel, but there's no power in it, and it's because it's not the gospel. See, I want to ask you this morning, maybe work ethic is your wheelhouse that you brought to the table when you heard the gospel. And maybe that's what you're used to bringing. Maybe intelligence is your wheelhouse. And maybe that's what you're used to bringing to the table. The old thing that you thought was going to help you in the kingdom. Simon warns us that in the kingdom, make sure you don't just blend the old way of life with the new that Jesus is inviting us into. I mean, Mary Kondo is right. Get rid of the room, everything in the room to redesign. Take it all out, tear it all down, and only put back in that which is true, that which is good, that which brings joy. No more syncretism. All of it must die if the good news is fully actually to come in our lives. Isn't it true that you can't blend the old ways of shame with the gift of God's grace in your heart? Isn't that true? Shame plus grace, it ruins the soil and, and the seed doesn't grow. We can't try to blend these insecurities and insufficiencies that we've lived with together when God's call comes. And when we do, we somehow, what we'll find is we somehow remain, we've figured out how to remain in control rather than being abandoned in faith. And it ruins the soil, the seed doesn't grow. Now, maybe you're saying this morning, well, I haven't tried to buy anything. I've never, you know, I've never tried to buy the gospel or buy grace or buy the power. And yet, while we may not have tried to buy it, God's favor, we certainly try to earn it. We certainly think that way. And, and that's the same thing. We may not try to buy God's power, but we certainly attempt like magicians to control it, don't we? However, imagine the Holy Spirit turning to you like Peter did to Simon and saying, may your self-sufficiency perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God through striving. I, I, I should say that again. Imagine Peter turned to, you, to us this morning and said, may your, all of your self-sufficiency perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God through your striving. What I want to give you Peter's saying, God is saying, is not something you can buy or manipulate or control. Listen to what Peter says in light of that. If you continue without change, you will have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Part or lot is a reference to the, the Levites who, who, it says, their portion was the good portion. They, their portion wasn't this land or that land. It was the Lord. And this is what he's saying, you, you're not going to get the Lord. You're not going to be a priest. You're not going to serve God if you think this way, if you try and bring these two things together. He says the soil of your heart is not right before God. Maybe the soil of our hearts this morning isn't right before God. I'll let the Holy Spirit convict you about that if it's true. And he continues saying, For I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Gall being a reference to a bitter or poisoned cup. Essentially saying there's good something good in the cup and you've poisoned it. That's what gall is. It's like the bile. You've poisoned it and made it bitter. You've mixed two things together that shouldn't go together and it will lead to your demise. And he says the bond of iniquity, which is better translated the bonds of injustice, means if you lead out of that place, of syncretism, of false, the false gospel internally in your heart. You might say it with your mouth, but if it's not alive on the inside, you are going to reap injustice and brokenness in your life and others that you try to love. You're going to perpetuate it. And that's why Peter says, listen, the gall of bitterness, the bonds of injustice, break them now. Break them. They're sober warnings. He says it's possible, though, that you can yet do the work of repentance. That's the way, <laughs> repentance. That there's still time to do the work of tending to the soil of your heart. It, as long as it's today, hear the voice of the Spirit. This is the opportunity that Lent affords us to sharpen our discernment, to allow the Word of God to, to cut between bone and marrow, not outwardly, you know, we're not cutting things up, but inwardly in our own hearts. 
Lent invites the joyful work of confession this morning about the pride or the greed or whatever it is that we have tolerated in our hearts that's warped our ability to receive and experience the great grace and freedom of the gospel of all that God wants to lavish on us. So this morning, the call is simple. The response is simple. If you have pride today, if you perceive it in the soil of your heart, a spirit of self, selfishness, self-absorption, self-loathing, self-pity, it doesn't matter what you call it. If it's self, it's pride. Come and confess it this morning. Turn to someone this morning in a few moments and confess it. Make a statement today before God and let him cleanse you. Lord, I confess I have trusted in myself. I have sought things on my own strength. I have made things about me. I've been so caught up in my life, I've actually diminished my worship and my, and my, and my desire. And I've, I've sought after my own treasures. It's all pride. Pray for mercy and God, God will lavishly, joyfully give you all of his grace. If you have greed today, if you have striving, hopelessness, fears, shame, or worries, anxieties, confess them before God and you will be cleansed. He'll cleanse you. Don't integrate them. Don't think and continue to integrate them into your old identity or your new identity. Confess them, purge them, release them, unhinge yourself from the old way and run fully into the, in, into the new. It doesn't mean you need to understand it, but today, make a statement to God. Confess your sins. Don't hold back all from all that is yours and God's by, by grace. Turn over the soil of your heart so that God might reap a full harvest from your life. A harvest of grace, a harvest of love and kindness. You were made to be fruitful and to multiply. A harvest of faithfulness. Let, let God be glorified let your life be a sounding board, a, a, a place of resonance for the grace and the mercy of God. And on, let the honor and thanksgiving of our lives fully surrendered and trust before God bring him all of the glory. Let's exalt him this morning because he's beautiful. Jesus loves us and we get to celebrate that every day. So I want to do what, what, what Simon asked, just pray for you. Pray to the Lord that nothing that was due to you would come upon you. Nothing that would do because of the cross, we know it's already fallen on Jesus. So rather, let us instead receive what is due to Jesus as the heir of God, the firstborn of the dead, and the mediator of a new covenant. So God, this morning, as we now confess our sins, we confess, Lord, our half-heartedness. We confess Lord, what it is that has been holding us back. We confess the, the hardness of the soil of our hearts and we turn it over, God, to you by faith, saying, Lord, here we are. We don't want this anymore. We confess and we thank you, Lord, that the blood of Jesus forgives. The blood of Jesus heals. The blood of Jesus restores. The grace and mercy of God are poured out and the fire of God falls on this offering. And so I bless your people, Lord. Let all of the grace of God, all of the good news penetrate and, and, and be, Lord, just glorious in their lives, shine in their lives. The love and the treasure, the beauty of God be ours. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.